Up next on my check through the IMDb bottom 100 is number 40, 365 days. Possibly the most popular one on this list in terms of viewership, not in terms of people who like it. The first of the trilogy that became an international success despite the fact that seemingly everyone hates it. In addition to its place on IMDb, it's done even worse on Letterboxd as the second lowest rated movie on that site behind only Dragon Ball Evolution with an overall rating of 1. But at the same time, it's not hard to see the reason why it's popular. Yes, this is basically the Polish version of Fifty Shades of Grey, except worse in almost every way. This is going to be hard to talk about with YouTube's restrictions on what to say in the video, but I guess it doesn't really matter since I don't qualify for monetization either way. If you see an ad before this video, it's because of some bullshit copyright claim. I'm making no money. Hey, did I mention I have a Patreon? I kind of gave up on plugging it after a while, but you can still give to it. Please. If you do it, I can suck. Now, I haven't seen or read any Fifty Shades of Grey books or movies. I'm not the target audience. I'm a man, I'm straight, and girls don't want to take me to the kinky sex movie. I'm not knowledgeable on the movie that inspired it, but there is a solution to this problem. The problem of me not knowing much about Fifty Shades, not the fact that I will die alone. It turns out that in addition to the 365 Days trilogy they distributed, Netflix also has the Fifty Shades trilogy. I'm gonna have to watch this one first, aren't I? Those of you who know the series know that I usually review some relevant movie first, whether it's the movie that preceded a sequel or the movie that the main movie rips off. This is the worst pairing of movies I've had so far. But anyway, let's get on to the first terrible movie, Fifty Shades of Grey. The story of this franchise starts with a normal, middle-aged British woman by the name of E.L. James who decided to publish a fan fiction of Twilight where Edward and Bella have kinky sex. I don't know anything about Twilight either, but we're not going to get into that. But whatever, she has an erotic Twilight fanfiction until she decides to make some changes to it to make it into an original piece where a billionaire has kinky sex with a college girl. From what I heard, the result, maybe unsurprisingly, wasn't very well written. Apparently half the time it isn't even grammatically correct. Anyway, it became a global phenomenon. For reasons. So, unsurprisingly, every major movie studio wanted a piece of this, quality be damned. It received movie right bids from Warner Brothers, Sony, Paramount, and Mark Wahlberg's production company. In the end, the rights went to Universal and Focus Features. E.L. James wanted to have some kind of control on set, and she was able to get Michael DeLuca and Dana Brunetti, the producer team behind The Social Network, to produce this. For the adaptation of the fan fiction turned mommy porn novel. Fred Easton Ellis, best-selling author of American Psycho, had expressed interest in writing it for some reason. But the job went to Kelly Marcel, writer of Saving Mr. Banks and future writer of Venom and Cruella. Patty Jenkins, Bill Condon, Bennett Miller, and Steven Soderbergh were all considered for director. They almost went with Joe Wright, the Oscar-nominated man behind Pride and Prejudice, Atonement, and future director of Darkest Hour for this adaptation of the mommy porn fanfic book. But his schedule made him unavailable. So they went with Sam Taylor Johnson, an unknown director who had only made one movie up to that point, 2009's Nowhere Boy. There was a very high profile casting process for this. Some actresses considered for the female lead, the totally not stupidly named Anastasia Steele, were Felicity Jones, Shailene Woodley, Alicia Vikander, Imogen Poots, and Elizabeth Olsen. Game of Thrones star Amelia Clark was also offered the role, but turned it down because, surprise, it involved nudity and she didn't want to be typecast as an actress who does nude scenes. The audition process involved reading a four-page section from Ingrid Bergman's Persona. They ended up casting a relatively unknown Dakota Johnson, and Sam Taylor Johnson said that it was an easy choice after seeing her audition. Ryan Gosling was considered for the male lead Christian Grey, but turned it down. Charlie Hunnan was offered the role, turned it down initially, but then reconsidered after meeting with some studio heads, and later he actually got cast. But he dropped out due to scheduling conflicts with filming Sons of Anarchy, and the casting process was on again. After considering a bunch of others, they eventually went with Jamie Dornan, who Sam Taylor Johnson now says she can't imagine anyone else in the role. Taylor Johnson cited Nine and a Half Weeks, Last Tango in Paris, and Blue is the Warmest Color as inspirations for what she wanted to do with this movie. She also talked with dominatrixes to research the role. Filming took place in Vancouver. And also, this was the last credit from Anne V. Coates, the Oscar-winning editor of Lawrence of Arabia, before her death. This adaptation of the Mommy Porn fanfic book. There was speculation that it would be released with an NC-17 rating. You know, I'd be willing to respect this movie a lot more if it turned out to be the one that became the success with that rating and took away at least some of the stigma of it in America. But no, it ended up being rated R, citing things like strong sexual content including dialogue and some unusual behavior. Imagine reading that while knowing nothing about this movie. Hell, this movie's got a rating of 15 and up in Australia. 
On the other hand, it was still graphic enough to get banned in several countries, and the studio decided to just not bother trying to get this a release in China. Even when studios would bend over backwards to edit movies for that China money, there were still points where it just wasn't worth it. It was also censored in the Philippines and Zimbabwe, and the cut released in Vietnam had no sex scenes at all. Damn, all this provocativeness, all these respectable people, all those highbrow influences. With all this, it must be an intelligent masterpiece. Fun fact, the day I watched this, I went out to see Didi, which is now my new favorite movie of the year so far. Then I went back home to watch this piece of garbage. Yeah, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree here. It's still based on a trashy sex novel that was once a fan fiction of a hated book and movie series for teenage girls. And it shows. Although a lot of the critical consensus at least says that it was better than the source material, which I guess is inevitable considering it's a major Hollywood motion picture by professionals and the source material is just a fan fiction that was hastily changed into non-fan fiction and doesn't even have basic grammar. But where do I start? Let's go with the story. There is none. The story is on par with actual porn. It's just two people meet up, start banging a lot, and then by the end, stop. At least for some time. It ends very abruptly. It feels like just the first two acts of an actual movie. You'd expect some sort of big climax to wrap things up, but it doesn't come. In screenwriting classes, they say that two-thirds in, there should be a scene where the characters are at their lowest point. This movie takes the characters to that point and then rolls the credits immediately after. There was apparently an alternate ending. It says that on the Wikipedia page, but the source just leads to a 404 error, so I don't know for sure. But either way, this scene sounds really cheesy, but it would at least make it feel like an actual ending. And it's not like the rest of the movie wasn't cheesy before. But this lack of a story also affects the movie before that. This movie is over two hours long and nothing happens, meaning that every time they aren't having sex, things are boring. And it's not even a well-made boring. This is basically just an overblown soap opera. The only difference is that big things happen in soap operas. Okay, I'm going to entertain the idea that it's better than the books and that all of its flaws come from said books. I guess while looking at it from that standpoint, I can see that the cinematography was pretty good, though I probably wouldn't have noticed if I wasn't looking for it but it still looks sleek and sexy. The actors, I guess, might be good, but I can't really tell because the material they're given is so overwhelmingly bad. I don't know whether they know that the dialogue is melodramatic and terrible, and so they just don't have that kind of passion, or they really are giving great performances, but the script is just that bad. Both of those options are equally likely. Might I bring up poor Dakota Johnson? She's become more famous because of these movies, and I've seen her name around a lot more than Jamie Dornan. She's been in a few smaller movies and gave some decent performances in them, but unfortunately most people know her only for her work in this piece of crap. And then she finally gets the lead role in a big superhero movie which was probably her chance to redeem herself in the eyes of the mainstream. It was her Robert Pattinson's Batman moment. All the movie needs to do now is not be terrible. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. So she didn't get her Batman moment. I don't even think she got her good time or the lighthouse moment yet. But I guess it's good for her that she's still more known than Dornan at least. But whatever, we all know that the target audience doesn't care about acting or writing or any of that crap. People only want to see the sex scenes, making the Vietnamese cut completely worthless. So how are these scenes? They're okay I guess, I'm not the best guy to address whether or not women would be attracted to this. You know I'm straight because I've said it twice in this video so far. But they seem somewhat serviceable. Except, I think the biggest thing this movie has going against it is its R rating. It's graphic and all, but there are probably sexier things on your average episode of Game of Thrones or Euphoria. Nothing really worth going out for in an age where people can just get more graphic stuff on the internet for free. Also, for a movie that tries to be basically just porn for women, why don't we ever see Christian Grey's penis? We see all of Anastasia Steele. Grey is the guy the audience actually came to see naked. Why is his butt crack the most we see of him? Also, every sex scene is set to a pop song. This movie has a soundtrack of songs from a lot of popular artists, and many of them were recorded for this movie specifically. And it's a good soundtrack. I mean, it must be. It has a song nominated for an Oscar and another for a Golden Globe. Probably my favorite part of the whole movie was the needle drop for Love Me Like You Do by Ellie Goulding in the helicopter scene, because it involves the movie pretty much just stopping to let the song play. No amount of association with this movie will make the song slap any less. But for the sex scenes, it just seems kind of a bit of a distraction. It resembles more just a very erotic music video than something actually sexy. Apparently, shortly after Universal got the movie rights, they filed a lawsuit against the adult film company Smash Pictures for announcing that they would produce another adaptation. They claimed it violated copyright and said that having a porn version of this would cause plaintiffs irreversible harm by poisoning public perception of the Fifty Shades trilogy and the forthcoming Universal films, without even a hint of irony. 
It was settled out of court that the Smash version would not be made. I bring this up now because that would probably be the best way to adapt this book. The writing is pretty much poor in level, the story as well, you don't have to tone anything down. The only way to do this book faithfully is with the most graphic scenes you can get, and Adult Film was pretty much the only way you can get that. Why did we need to see a porn book adapted in such a sleek, stylish way? That's like hiring Martin Scorsese to remake Deep Throat, especially since the book is apparently so sloppily written. So that's another reason to hate this movie. It kept us from getting an appropriate adaptation. Also, this isn't a complaint, but at one point Anastasia asked, What are butt plugs? I mean, I know I'm not the first person to point out how weird it is that she doesn't know this already, but what I think is also weird is that this line comes right after they were talking about other, slightly lesser known toys, which she seems to know about, or at least could figure it out because their names are just as self-explanatory. How could someone know what genital clamps are but not butt plugs? But anyway, let's wrap this up. This is worse than a lot of the so-called worst movies that I've watched for this list, and just because it's a bad drama doesn't automatically make it fun in the way that The Room is. I would rather watch some of the terrible comedies again. At least those were kind of fun. Getting to see how lowbrow they'd get? This is just boring, corny, and probably isn't even that hot. It's torture, and I've subjected myself to it. Isn't that hot? So it was released on Valentine's Day of 2015. Reviews were harsh, but it still became a massive success. It grossed over 500 million off a budget of 40 million. A box office poll that set a lot of very niche box office records that are too numerous for me to list off. Although it bombed in Japan, so at least we have that. Even if part of it may have been because it was censored there. And of course they adapted the other two books in the trilogy. Although Sam Taylor Johnson clashed frequently with E.L. James, so she chose not to direct any of them. She was replaced by James Foley, director of Glengarry Glen Ross for both of them. That replacement did not make them much better. But after the release of Fifty Shades Freed, it was all over, and nobody had to deal with anything like it again. Right? Right? Let me just pop in this 8-track, and you just give a listen and tell what you think, okay? Boogie Nights is such a cool movie. These are the ones. These are great. Yeah, those are really cool. Are they lizards? No, they're Italian. Disco was king, sex was safe, and pleasure was big business. Jack Horner, filmmaker. Filmmaker. Exotic picture. Definitely one of the best pictures of the year. Boogie Nights. A max hit at 8, Thursday, April 22nd on Cinemax. Days is a Polish film based on the novel of the same name by Blanka Lipinska. Like Fifty Shades, it was also the first in a trilogy of erotic novels. The movie was directed by Barbara Bielawas and Tomasz Mandes, and written by Tomasz Klimata, based on a screen story he wrote with Bielawas and Lipinska. There isn't really a whole lot of info on production, so I'm guessing it was pretty standard stuff. Also, I'm guessing this movie's international success came pretty much out of nowhere because I can't find an English trailer for this. It wasn't even that easy to find a Polish trailer. When I typed 365 days trailer into YouTube, even when I specified 2020, the results were still all for the sequels, or some montage of scenes that had the word trailer in the title for some reason. I had to Google it. And even when I did that, the first thing that came up was a trailer for the sequel, which had the title of the original in the link for some reason. But whatever, the point is that there was no English promotion for this. Netflix probably just looked at it and thought, well this sucks, let's just put it on the site and forget about it. But people discovered it anyway. Finally, a Fifty Shades type movie that knows what really turns women on. Questionable consent or just flat out no consent. Yeah, this is when the trigger warning kicks in. But anyway, let's get on to it. It's about a male gangster who right at the beginning is doing some deal with the black market or something or whatever alongside of his father. He then sees an attractive woman on the beach below and his father sees that and starts giving him some lecture about how the guy should remember that he'll be head of the family business when the father dies and he shouldn't sideline his responsibilities. Something that doesn't really come up again to the best of my knowledge. I'm guessing he didn't listen to him since this movie's more about him having sex than any mafia stuff. And then they both get shot alongside a spray of CGI blood. Cut to the title, playing over some discount version of Creed. I want you now, I want to go. 
He immediately cut to five years later. The father died, but the son is still alive and is pretty much thriving as the head of the gang. And now he finds the woman he was looking at, after a long search he did because he had fallen in love with her after seeing her for like five seconds years ago. And so he does what any normal person would do. Kidnap her. And force her to stay with him, saying that he'd let her go if she doesn't fall in love with him within 365 days. And he says that he won't sleep with her unless she wants it. So yeah, you know what that means. Yep. What a great setup for a sexy romance movie. First, let's get off the horrific concept to talk about the actors. They suck. The acting in Fifty States of Grey was at least better than this. After being kidnapped, the girl in question barely even really seems to be that worried about it. I mean, she is a little but not in the way any normal person would be after being kidnapped by a madman. She acts as if this was basically just an inconvenience. I mean, the first thing she sees in this house before she shows up is a huge painting of her face. Seeing that in your kidnapper's house is some really horrifying shit. And horrifying is basically the word that best describes the man. You'd think this kind of concept would be more of a horror or thriller type story. And he apparently didn't get the memo that it isn't, so he just decides to act as despicable as possible. He made the promise to never touch her without her consent, but that doesn't stop him from being creepy with her in other ways. What a gentleman. Only sexually harasses the woman he kidnapped. Damn it, why kidnapping? Couldn't you just stalk her like a normal person would? Also, before all this happens, we get a scene of him getting the flight attendant to do a thing to him that she didn't seem to want to do. See, he must really love the woman he kidnapped if he promised not to do that to her. So much restraint. What a sacrifice. And what's worse is that it's basically shot like just another sex scene. It's erotic, set to a pop song, and in a cut with shots of the female lead doing things to herself. And I think that's the first time she appears in this movie aside from a scene where the man sees her on the beach. So at this point we still basically know nothing about her except that the man saw her one time years ago. If one was to watch this movie without knowing what it was about, that person would probably presume that she'd never be mentioned again. At the very least establish that she's unsatisfied with her own boyfriend before this. The movie waits until afterwards to establish that, and that's really stupid. Also, after the woman gets kidnapped, she gives up on even trying to escape pretty early on. Maybe less than 15 minutes after it happens, she approaches some cops who don't help her because... I guess they work for the kidnapper or something? It's unclear. He basically just shows up and they walk away. And then he tells her that it's best to just accept her situation, and apparently that's enough for her to just accept it, without even any feeling of defeat. From this point on, she just goes everywhere with him without protest and buys a lot of expensive stuff with his money. You know, in the scene where she finds out that she's being kidnapped, she says some stuff along the lines of, I'm not your property. Well, it turns out she is. Take that, feminism. And the whole 365 days thing is pretty pointless because she falls in love with him in just a few months. I don't know whether or not the whole movie takes place over 365 days, but if that's what you're going for, at least let it be known. If it isn't, then why would you have her fall in love so far before the deadline? Either way, it happens in the scene where they're on his boat and he's yelling at her for inadvertently starting a gang war. You see, what happened was, they were in the club, members of another gang started harassing her, and the male lead got into a fight with them over it. You know, her fault. Now at some point you're gonna have to give him some kind of redeeming value. But anyway, they get into a fight since she's obviously rightfully pissed off. And then she falls off the boat and the man saves her. And of course, apparently that's enough for her to forgive him for being an irredeemable monster. And they have sex. In a montage set to a pop song. And this montage shows them in different positions and different parts of the boat. I'm like, damn, take a break sometime. Let's not forget that you hated him like five minutes ago. Which brings us to probably the only thing this has over Fifty Shades of Grey. Remember when I said it was worse in almost every way? Well, here's the only way it isn't worse. It was not rated by the MPAA, so it doesn't have to censor jack shit. This is basically a lot of the same thing as Fifty Shades. Erotic scenes set to some kind of music, except they're noticeably longer and a bit more graphic. Let's see. Yep, it was enough to get the 18 and operating in Australia. The only thing that can possibly keep this from being sexier than Fifty Shades is... Oh yeah, the fact that this is a Stockholm Syndrome situation. They want us to believe that they actually do belong together, but we all know that's crap. If the filmmakers gave us some reason to sympathize with the man and see him as an anti-hero who's a good guy at heart, that would be one thing. I don't think there's any way to fully counteract the fact that he kidnapped her. I'm talking if they just tried. But I don't think we see his good side even once. His only redeeming value seems to be just that he's really sexy. The girl is quoted as saying that he has a body that was sculpted by angels and a penis that was sculpted by the devil. I think the devil also made his personality. Most romance movie directors fear the complaint that the audience won't believe the couple belong together. This movie might be the first to make people actively wish they wouldn't get together. Oh, and we still don't see the man's dick. Why? 
after the devil put so much effort into it. There's a scene here where they're in a shower together and the guy notices that she's checking it out and he asks stuff like, do you like what you see? I don't know, she seems to be into it, but I'm pretty sure the audience would actually like to judge for themselves. You know, show them the only reason that they would put up with all the bad stuff in this movie. And everything that happens after they fall in love is kind of pointless. Yes, there's a little bit of plot, but now that they're already together, it's like, what more do we need to see from this movie? Most of it is just sex and pointless scenes in together. Keep in mind, this is pretty much almost the last half of the movie. From this point on, there's very little plot, and it's more boring than Fifty Shades of Grey. This might be the first movie I've watched in this series where I genuinely could not wait until it was over. At one point, she meets her old boyfriend, and she refuses to take him back because he cheated on her. Yeah, she'll stay with her new boyfriend who only kidnapped her, sexually harassed her, and forced her to fall in love with him. It ends on a cliffhanger. If you don't know it's a trilogy, then it just seems like an allegedly tragic ending. But seeing that there are sequels, you can clearly see that they left it just ambiguous enough that you don't fully know what happened, even though in any standalone movie it would be very obviously implied. And yes, this ending would have been tragic, but only for the girl. Excuse me if I'm not crying about how the kidnapper and rapist is sad now. Look, I'm okay with this being some people's sexual fantasy. The idea of having a rich, sexy gangster take them away from their old life. But when you let a story this sleazy escape its niche in the porn book world and try to pass itself off as art, even as lowbrow art, and asks people who don't have that kind of fantasy to believe that these people belong together, that's a whole other thing. Anyway, it opened in Polish theaters in 2020 and went straight to Netflix everywhere else. Although in the UK, it did have a limited theatrical release first. Obviously, critics hated it and criticized its problematic elements, in addition to its failure in every other aspect of filmmaking. According to Wikipedia, it's considered to be one of the worst movies ever made. There's apparently an entire list of movies on Wikipedia considered the worst, and 365 Days made it. Although there's a lot of entries there, so maybe people are just being overdramatic. No, this is one of, if not the worst movies I've ever seen. And I've seen Kirk Hammond Saving Christmas. I can't decide which one's worse. But despite that, a lot of people were probably sexually frustrated during COVID, so it became a worldwide hit on Netflix. And much like Fifty Shades, it even got a few songs from the soundtrack to go viral. Although that success also led to more controversy from non-critics, with many criticizing Netflix for even putting it on the platform in the first place. But who cares, because they've got another hit franchise. COVID delayed the production of any sequels, but they were both eventually filmed back-to-back -back and both released in 2022. The reviews didn't get much better, though. Now, where was I? Oh yeah, I hate this movie. I hate the story, I hate the fake romance, I hate the acting, I hate the dialogue, I hate the soap opera type storytelling, I hate the characters, I hate everything it stands for, I hate the way that it walk, I hate the way that it talk, I hate the way that it dress. Finally, a zero star movie that truly belongs at the bottom of the list. I probably look like I'm no fun having so bad it's good movies like Santa Claus Conquers the Martians and Mac and Ian the Bottom. Finally, we have something with no redeeming values to put in last place. Although, I will say that its production value is actually pretty fitting for an adaptation of a mommy porn book. This is a truly awful movie. Sexploitation at its most evil. Had what could be a good concept for a psychological thriller about sexism and entitlement, and inexplicably turns it into a romance movie that actually endorses both of those things. And the worst part is, there are two more of these. And they're coming up at some point on the list. Music